makes your neighborhood great? What sets it apart? What definitive moments have happened to you there? What does your neighborhood mean to you? This was our writing prompt. Asking this about Maya Logan betrays the ignorance of those asking it. That story is an epic in this neighborhood, not a tender anecdote, but I will do my best. Mario Logan is 500 years of resistance. Mario Logan is my mother's onyx eyes and my daughter's raven hair. Mario Logan is survival and salvation. Mario Logan is a piece of liberated asthma. Mario Logan is Chica Malika. It is the forefront of our political battles since April 22, 1970, when the city had promised the Hinfea Park, but instead began construction of a highway control station. On this day, Chicano students, community members, artists, moms and pops, abuelos y abuelas occupied the park until the city came and handed over what many would consider worthless land. Land under a bridge. Land of concrete. But the ability to make beauty out of ashes is a skill well honed by oppressed people. The people planted and cultivated the land themselves. And so became Chicano Park. And so became the murals. And through the murals, Barbara Logan became the keeper of our art. Logan, Chicano Park, they are safe spaces for Chicano artists to unabashedly create images and sculptures and poems about our experiences long before the current renaissance that has brought many of you here today. In many ways, this renaissance threatens these havens. See, these murals depict a history and a legacy that has been systematically hidden from my people. They, therefore, they are not only a beacon to Chicano artists, but a call far and wide to all Chicanos, Mexicanos, Mexican Americans, Mexica, that hear the calling of the drum of truth, those who are seeking the way I was seeking. Growing up Chicana, or Chicana, Chicanex, in solidarity with the Two-Spirit Nation, it was shadows and it was light. It was allowing grace and love, masa and trenzas, to guide me through the dark like a torch. I didn't know exactly where it was taking me, but I had to trace the remnants my mother left me. They were the only clues I had as to all the lies. And those breadcrumbs led me here. See, I didn't know why my mother was violent, why my father was bitter. I didn't understand why our family dynamics were so far from what I saw on family guides. I learned to act American, to talk and smile, and all the pleasantries I use at the office every day from these shows. But from my home, I learned to work hard, to get up and go to work every day, no matter how I felt, to provide for my children, that my highest priority is always to keep my family united. I learned how a warm meal with two tortillas heated over an open flame made everything better at the end of the day, even though you were chastised for speaking Spanish at elementary school, or a friend was pulled over by police and arrested for nipple weed, starting them on a long path towards prison. Or even later, when as a pregnant teenager, the school called the police on your boyfriend because he was 18 and you were 16, although you'd been together for years, and never returned to traditional school. Despite the constant attacks by the world around us, I learned from home that family and perseverance would get you through the night. And it has. Still, had I believed the narratives around me about my people, my culture, my family, had I stopped asking why when the rule replied, because you come from a bad family, because Mexicans are stupid, because Mexicans are corrupt, because America is a meritocracy, if you were smart and hardworking, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be where you are today. If I had believed that, I would have accept, accepted my fate. But those blessed breadcrumbs. My mother would tell stories about Guatemoc, one of the last Mexica emperors, every time we would pass the roundabout in Tijuana that was raised by a statue of his likeness. Uh, the Spanish conquistadores tortured him, burned off the soles of his feet so that he would confess where the piles of gold were hidden. And my mother's version he never told. Was that who I was? Loyal and steadfast, courageous and righteous against all odds? When homeboys from the neighborhood began aging out of the juvenile correction system and doing stints in prison, they would return with Nahua words. Their arms newly adorned with tattooed images, I remembered seeing you when I would visit my aunt in Barrio Logan or stop by Chicano Park. A strange dragon with feathers called Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican god of arts and knowledge. Was he the one relentlessly calling me towards my ancestry? Was that me on my homeboy's bicep, regal, proud, flowy, with the stacked pyramid behind me like a crown? Then, when I was 18, 
the internet happened. <laughs> and 700 years of hidden history came tumbling into my lap with a few keystrokes. Mexico. Suddenly, I had bad book lists and fierce nomenclature of a struggle I didn't even know I was a part of, yet had felt my whole life. I had the history of this body room. The story of our people reclaiming a piece of land for ourselves, achieving what some thought was impossible through protest, organization, and community. I learned about the American Holocaust, the atrocities that happened to my ancestors. I began to understand why my mother's lineage was cloudy at best, why two generations back were all I had, and why those stories of trauma, why those stories were of trauma and loss, panic, and profound sadness. I came to realize that my mother's violent tendencies were vestiges of the sadistic measures conquistadores had inflicted upon her ancestors, my ancestors. I understood that my father's bitterness was a product of being a second-class citizen on his own ancestral lands. We weren't a bad family, we weren't a corrupt people, but a people healing from catastrophic trauma. We are resilient survivors. Even more enlightening was when I learned of who we were before the conquest. First-hand accounts of Spanish soldiers, journal entries, and letters tell about how they died, they thought they died and gone elsewhere. They pinched each other to ensure that they were really looking out over a pristine city of white atop a series of canals. A city on a lake in the middle of a beautiful valley, two volcanoes facing the horizon. My people had built aqueducts that brought fresh water into the city before aqueducts were even imagined across the Atlantic. They had engineered floating gardens that fed the entire population of about, of about 50,000 people. There were marketplaces unlike any Europeans had ever seen, pyramids that rose into the clouds over vast plazas where people congregated. There was no poverty. There were scholars, there were artists, there were poets. This is Barrio Logan. It is a resurgence of my people's greatness. I did not grow up here like so many of the amazing artists, activists, community members that I've met since making this my home. I grew up in Eastside San Diego. And growing up, Eastsiders didn't come into Southeast. But as my knowledge grew, the drums got louder and louder. And as gentrification and cultural genocide pressed in from all sides, I followed those drums. I retreated here to outstretch my arms, to dance in the confidence of knowing who I am, where I come from, and where I am going. Barrio Logan isn't the new upcoming neighborhood to get a good craft beer and record space. Sure, it can be those things as long as people understand that it really isn't. As long as visitors understand that any story told or written about the barrio that isn't tied to the Chicano, Mexicano, Latino culture and movement that was born here is not valid. And I know that might ruffle a few feathers, but then I am the feathered serpent. I am Yashika, and Barrio Logan is my home.